We got the whole record done in three days. We mixed it in three days and we shopped it around and all these labels turned her down for ridiculous various reasons. And then Jack White and the third man crew heard it. They loved it. They signed it immediately. They bought the record as is, no changes. And it came out and she was the first girl in Billboard history to have a top 10 record without a hot trending song. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Matt Ross Spang, a Grammy-winning engineer, mixer, producer, and recording historian. Matt began his career at the young age of 16, interning at Sun's studio in Memphis, Tennessee, which he revitalized during his decade of work there, bringing it back to its original analog roots. After his time at Sun Studio, he has more recently migrated over to Sam Phillips Recording Services, home office and studio for the legendary Sam Phillips. In 2015, Matt won a Grammy for engineering and mixing Jason Isbell, Something More Than Free, and he has recently broken the top 10 Billboard country charts for engineering, mixing, and co-producing Margot Price's debut record, Midwestern Farmer's Daughter, for Third Man Records. Matt's extensive credits in the studio include Mary Chapin Carpenter, Jerry Lee Lewis, Grace Potter and the Nocturnals, Jacob Dylan, Justin Towns Earl, J.D. McPherson, Chris Isaac, Mark Ronson, the Wood Brothers, and Brett Denon, to name just a few. And he has also worked with acclaimed producers like Dave Cobb. The city of Memphis has even nominated Matt as one of its 30 under 30 Memphians, and in 2016 awarded him a key to the city while proclaiming April 25th, 2016 as Matt Ross Spang Day in Germantown, Tennessee. That's just cool as shit, dude. (laughs) I don't even know where to begin. (laughs) So I am very thrilled to be bringing you this interview from inside the time capsule that is Sam Phillips Recording Services here in Memphis as part of my Memphis series. Please welcome Matt Ross Spang to Recording Studio Rockstars. Matt, are you ready to rock? Uh, I think I am. (laughs) I think you are, dude. I think you may have already rocked. Can you introduce yourself as well in your own words and tell us more about who you are and how you got to be here? Um, when, my name is Matt Rossbang, like you said. I'm born and raised in Memphis and uh, just a big old audio nerd, really. Just happy to be here. So you started at 16, really, over at Sun Studio? Yeah, I, re- I recorded there when I was 14. I was in a, I played with a couple guys, and the whole goal for us wasn't really to play live shows or anything like that. It was to get in the studio. And we got two hours of studio time at Sun, and that was the first time I'd ever been in a studio or seen a recording process happen. And the engineer there was James Lott. He was kind of this old hippie guy. He wore a beret. He cussed like a sailor. He called you babe. I know the time, he probably was a little drunk. And... Uh, Needless to say, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I remember the other guy in the band didn't care. He he laid on the he slept on the floor while he mixed it. He could care less. And of course, I was hunkered over his shoulder, watching him work the console and the effects and the compressors and stuff. And it just blew my mind. So he told me to come back and intern sometime when I could. And I ended up started working there as a tour guide at Sun. When I was 16, I came in as a tour guide. And at night, I would assist in the studio because we didn't start till six o'clock at night. So I get out of high school, go straight to Sun, give tours to the to the public. And then at six, we you know record till wee hours in the morning. And luckily, the folks are pretty cool about it. But yeah, I just very lucky to know exactly what I wanted to do at such a young age. Yeah, well, you I, I had a kind of a similar experience. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing the inside of a studio for the first time. And uh, especially when you see a real studio, like yeah. what you saw, it's just really, it, it blows your mind, you know? It's kind of like, you know, when you're, uh, this is probably, uh, probably a bad example, but you know, like in elementary school, you don't look at girls like girls, you look at girls like gross girls. And at some point they become fascinating. And that was probably the studio too. You know, you, at some point you go in there and you, nothing for the, for those other guys, they weren't excited at all, but 
But for me, it just clicked. I was like, oh, I get it. I just matured faster than the rest of the, the other guys in the band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the studio like when you first saw it? We're going to get into this, but I know that you really transformed Sun Studio. You brought it back to its its roots. Well, or there's I, a story there, right? I, I you know, it's I, that's very nice of people to say that. Honestly, the the studio is unchanged. That's what's the beautiful part about Sun. It's the same acoustic tile. It's the same baffling. It's the same all, all the stuff that Sam Phillips and other equipment wise. It wasn't the same when I first started there. It was a Soundcraft TS24 console. We recorded through a kind of a homemade PC rig to uh, before sonar, it was Cakewalk Audio. And uh, we had a two-inch MCI machine that kind of was just a dust collector. I didn't know anything about microphones. I didn't know what SM57 was. I remember my first day as an assistant, the guy asked me if that Leslie worked, and I didn't even know what a uh, Leslie was. I was kind of like, uh, I'll find out. And I didn't even know what the Leslie was until the engineer, you know, plugged it up and turned it on. I was so I, I just didn't know anything. You, you were like, no, I don't think there's anybody named Leslie who works no, here. You know? no, yeah, there's no Leslie here. It wasn't the gear that Sam Phillips used. It was all more modern stuff, you know, from the 70s on. And as I worked there more and more, it was mostly a thing of we're using 24 tracks or we're using 18 tracks. We're using 12 tracks in this little room. Sun's about 18 by 30. Sam Phillips had four microphones going live to mono tape. And in the early cases, he went direct to disc. And that stuff sounded incredible. Wow. And I didn't... And, to my ears, what we were doing wasn't as cool sounding or as unique sounding. And and I think one of the biggest things about my favorite records are it's a producer, it's a certain band, but you can hear the uniqueness of where they cut or who it was without it being detrimental to the song. When you hear a Phil Spector record, you knew it was Phil Spector, but it wasn't like he hurt the song in order to get his sound. Or in case of George Martin with the Beatles, or with Willie Mitchell with Al Green. These guys, you knew Sam Phillips cut it, you knew Phil Spector did it, you knew where they did it, but it wasn't like it affected. The song still shined like it was supposed to, and that always blew my mind, and that's why I wanted to do it. Some was trying to figure out, kind of reverse engineer how Sam did it, maybe come out with my own unique version of it, but you know, if he could do it with four microphones and I can't do it with 12, then... It's, this is all on me, so yeah. it's kind of reverse engineered and start from there. This may be an ignorant question, but were you working with Sam, or did you meet Sam? No, or? Sam passed away in 2003. Uh, I he he I started the year after, a few months after he passed away. I, I never got to meet him, but a lot of the old. Oh, you started a few months after he passed away. Uh, you, probably that, like. But I mean, like six or relatively seven. that close. Yeah, I mean, he didn't. He never. Gosh. He never owned the studio. So, so Sam only rented that space. So he actually left in 1958 or 1960 when he built the studio we're in now. But he would stop by the studio a lot. James, the engineer there, taught me a lot. Scotty Moore, Elvis's guitar player, who was also an engineer, he remembered. A lot. Jam Van Eaton, who was the original house drummer, he remembered how the sessions were set up and all the equipment and stuff. And most after that, it's really just using your ears, yeah, you know, and and figuring it out. And it took a long time to kind of get it, but once I got it, I it just kind of blew my mind what what well, could be done. Let's come back to that because sure. I'm going to just flat out ask you what all those things were okay. that you just described. <laughs> but before we do, would you like to launch us off with an inspirational quote? You got anything from Sam uh, himself? I definitely have an inspirational quote. Uh, Jack Clement, who was the second engineer there at the time, uh, and he did a lot of the main engineering when Sam kind of got too big and had to do uh, take care of other things. But he said about recording, we're in the fun making business. So if we're not having fun, we're not doing our jobs. And that's, I think, the biggest part of any time I make a record, I, I, I probably say that quote to everybody. If we're not having fun, then we're not, it's not worth hitting record right now. So, right, because who wants to listen to it? Exactly. And why Why do it? I don't, I can't, I come every here every day because it's fun. I don't come here because it's obviously a money-making scheme or something. I come because it's incredibly fun and rewarding to do. So that's the main thing I tell, try and tell people, but that's a Cowboy Jack quote all the way. Nice. We're in the fun making business. Yeah, we're in the fun making business. If we're not having fun, we're not doing our jobs. Well, I'm having fun right now. Are you having fun? I'm having a blast. All right, cool. <laughs> well, now, how about telling us a story about an important failure for you? You know, as you've been making records for years, been doing doing music. Share with us a story about an important failure that maybe became a learning experience. For I think you. uh, you're going to fail a lot. Obviously, you could fail multiple times in a day. You can actually erase something. You can and do all so many things. It's how you handle that and how you learn from that and hopefully not do it again. I'd say a big moment for me was 
One of the first things I ever got to produce for today's standards, a fairly large budget was about 25 grand. It was a girl from overseas and I was asked to produce her record. I co-wrote half the record with her. I got some great Memphis people in. We did it for a month, which I think was probably maybe a week or two too long. We should have done it much quicker than that. But there were some issues that happened along the way and I won't go into specific details, but the record, I'd say this way, if you, we all have our horrifying high school yearbook photo. Well, if you could have that photo for a year before it came out in the yearbook, you'd probably Photoshop it or take it again or right. take it four times because you changed your haircut, got a new dress or sure, whatever. And then it wouldn't be you. It wouldn't be exactly who you are as a person. So I, I think you're describing my my online dating profile the, yeah, your now tender, with, that doesn't your have tender. the beard on there yet. <laughs> but all I'd say is that the record, it didn't come out when it was supposed to come out. And it was, it was really no one's fault. It just people wanted to ha- see changes done and took two or three years for the record to came out. I eventually stepped away from it and said, please take my name off as producer because you're doing changes I don't agree to. And, and everyone, it was amical. It was, a, it was hard because I'm like, who's going to hire me now? This thing hasn't even come out. You know, you don't know if people are going to talk bad about you and, and all these things or word will get out that, you know, this record went over budget and took too long and blah, 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 even though they don't know the circumstances. So that hurt at the time. But the thing you got to do in all these things is book the next gig right away and focus on the next thing. Because I've seen two, I've had too many friends that get in this business and are great engineers or producers and they focus on one project and they put all their energy into one project, even when it's done. And it's great. They're trying to help the people get signed and tour all this stuff, but that band might break up or that band, you know, might have one of them. I have a children and can't tour and all these things. And it's so so much is out of your hands that you have to. Once you finish that one, you can still be a part of it, but you got to book the next thing and the next thing and next thing to keep going and to keep learning stuff because you can't put all your eggs in the one basket. So that's, that's like the same advice for songwriting. I mean, that advice goes for this podcast. Exactly. You don't write one if you write one song and wait for Kenny Chesney or whoever to sing it. You're going to be waiting a long time. If you keep writing, you're, you're going to write a better. Everyone's favorite song is the one they just wrote. You know, so every time you write one, if you feel like you've gotten better, hopefully. So. Well, you know, and if I mess up an episode of this podcast, everybody's going to forget about that. Exactly. One. They're, they're They'll just forget gonna, about this one. Right no, they're going to remember this one, the really good one. <laughs> How about a, a moment of success for you? Something where everything really came together really nicely. And you that would probably be this aha moment. You know? Every I feel like every day is a success because I get to keep doing this. So I, I'm just so grateful. But Margot Price was this girl that she came in. I, at the time, I did not know this. She sold her and her husband play together. They write together. They pawned the, they pawned off her wedding ring and they sold their only car to come make a record at Sun. And we did, and I didn't know this at the time where I would have been like, listen, you can keep that stuff and pay the studio, you know, whenever you can. But they came in and we had, it was a pretty amazing experience. They had, they had no time to, to, to dilly dally. We did the whole record in three days wow. with no money. Um, I co-produced it with our, our mutual friend, Alex. We did it at Sun Studio. It was at six o'clock at night, we'd start recording and they did, you know, 11, 12 songs and every song I was blown away. And these guys all came in. The band was killer. They just played. It was a magical moment back to back to back. Usually when you're in the studio, you're lucky to get that one song like, man, we just nailed that. Like, let's call it for the day. We'll come back. We got the whole record done in three days. Amazing. And we mixed it in three days, and we shopped it around, and all of these labels turned her down for ridiculous various reasons. And then Jack White and the Third Man crew heard it, and and this is probably about a year later. They loved it. They signed it immediately. They bought the record as is, no changes, and it came out, and she was the first girl in Billboard history to have a top 10 record without a hot trending song, and her life's changing for all the amazing things she's been on. She's the only the sixth country artist ever to be on Saturday Night Live, and Margo and her husband are, and the band are just such great people, so to see that happen for them just makes me feel so good, because I yeah. believed in her, and I believe in this record, and so to see other people go for it, it's great. Well, it's a great title for the record, so, too, Midwestern Farmer's yeah, Daughter. Yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of a hint towards L- Loretta Lynn, and she's very much, I don't know, Margo's just one of those people. I, I wrote her a little letter the other day, not to compare myself to Sam Phillips or to compare her to Elvis, but I've recorded a lot of people at Sun for 10 years. You know, I, we worked, I worked over 330 days in the studio most year because it's a popular place and I, wow. I would never want to turn anyone down from a dream to come at Sun. So I booked it and I loved doing it. But I felt a little bit like, I wonder what Sam must have felt like when Elvis came in. And he started playing That's Right Mama, and he saw this natural talent that no one else had heard yet. I think there's something incredible about that. And I felt that way in, in regards to Margo. When her and her band came in, I was just completely 
blown away. And I was trying to not show that so much because you got to be clinical at, at, at points. But they they really blew me away. And I'm just so glad it's blowing other people away too. Yeah. So. All right. Well, let's let's just jump right into that for a sec. Tell us about recording that record. Let's geek out on it just a little bit. I mean, what? how did you record differently when you recorded Margot Price at Sun Studios in three days than somebody else might record somewhere else, you know, uh, in even a longer period of time? Well, when people come to Sun, I always have to, like, get them to stop Instagramming for, like, five, you know, people always want to Twitter or Instagram while they're there. And those guys, like I said, they all came to work. So everyone came in. They all have fun. We all we always make sure we're having fun, but they came in, they plugged in, they had their tone, they were ready to go. We didn't take forty five minutes to find the drummer or to get yeah. food. You know, they just had fun working. They just had an amazing time working, and uh, we do it all live. Uh, at Sun, I like to record pretty much all live, so we had no headphones, which I think is a big part of recording, especially at Sun, is not having headphones. So everyone's seeing each other, everyone's playing off each other dynamically in the room and making way 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 for the vocal. So now, what about Margot? Is she in a, does she has to be isolated for the vocal or no? No, Margot saying right in the room she overdubbed some vocals later to do some harmonies and stuff and like percussion things that we couldn't knock out in three days but it's all about polar patterns so like sm7 or rc77 that reject well and then putting them i found parts in the room where i could stick her kind of in the middle of where everybody could hear her voice naturally but the microphone would reject the drums it would pick up the drums in a great way so like when you hear um this town gets around on the record. I put her really close to the drums and most of that snare sound is coming through the drum mic. And it sounds like someone's just, I mean, the snare, I'm from Memphis. So historically our, all our mixes, the snare has to be louder than the vocal. If you listen so wait, to you said the snare is coming through the drum mic. Did you mean the vocal? I'm mic? a vocal mic. Vocal yeah. Mic. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the vocal mic's picking up a lot. It's picking up the drums. It's picking up the fiddle. It's picking up all kinds of stuff. And when I slap, put tape slap on her vocal, it's slapping the drum. It's slapping yeah. the, guitar, it's slapping the fiddle, it's slapping all these things. So that's kind of, the, and it gives you that depth. I think the hardest thing in recording is, is to get the depth. You can add reverb, you can add, uh, you can pan things, but it doesn't make things feel farther and close away. So when you listen to that record, her voice is here and the drums, you can feel like the drums are behind her, but it's mm. not a, a panning or volume thing. It's simply the microphones adding the depth. And, and which mic was that for that? Was it the uh, uh, 77 I think that was the SM7 I used on that SM7, song. okay, yeah. cool. Because the 77, I think, was uh, a little too boxy sometimes. It can be right. a little boxy on the snare. So the 77 has a figure eight pickup pattern, and you might have been thinking... It's adjustable depending on what... If you want to get really geeky, what version of the 77 you have? If you have a DX, a D, a C, or a B, I have the different. non-existent version. <laughs> <laughs> I, have two, I had two Ds at Sun that sounded extremely good, and you can adjust them to be various forms of cardioid, super cardioid and figure eight and stuff so I, I don't remember what pattern it was on it was probably i'm lazy i'm incredibly lazy so in the studio where people think i'm not but if the pattern if it sounds good i don't even look at the pattern it just right. it's yeah. whatever it was if it on. sounds good you're done yeah don't touch it so what about the performance did you find that when you have no headphones so it's pretty remarkable that everybody could hear the voice like that well um, they may and, not be able to but that's the cool thing is that when you have those no headphone moments is that everyone's listening to each other instead of listening to themselves. So the guitar player, while he may not be able to get the tone he wants because he can't have the amp on eight, he's got the tone, he's got the amp on three, but it's causing him to dig in on the solos and lay off on the verses and stuff. And then I don't have to mix it so much because the, the everyone comes down on the verse, gets up in the chorus, gets yeah. big on the bridge, goes on the solo. So I don't have to do as much automation. So it's kind of, as, like I said, I'm lazy. So they're going to write it themselves. It's great. But also, it forces everyone to pay attention to everybody and to pay attention to the vocals, which is the most important part anyway. So and I, I personally think that things don't sound good when they're hit hard. When you hit an acoustic guitar hard, it doesn't sound good. When you hit drums really hard, it doesn't sound good. When you hit them quiet, you get all the overtones and the harmonics and all these things, and it sounds incredible. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how, if you listen to a whole lot of shaking going on, how big that record sounds, and you realize how quiet they are actually playing, besides probably Jerry banging on the piano. When things are played quietly, you can compress them, you can bring them up, you can add things to them, and they'll sound huge. They'll sound like you're banging away. But when you're banging really hard, it chokes the notes, I think, on just about everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes things sound thinner and more tacky, which I, I hate. So part of it's the no headphone thing is to get sonically what I want to hear too, is how people play, forcing them to play a certain way. Yeah, no, I think it's great. All right. So you have an SM7 on her voice. Uh -huh. um, there's an element of acoustical blending going on in the room yeah. already. What about positioning of some of the instruments? How close would the drums be to that 
to that vocal mic? Were they, well, did the, they need to be all the way across the room? No, I've actually, I used to do that because naturally think put the thing far away, but then you get a phasiness where the drums are so far away that they're phasing out with the vocal when the vocals brought up with each other. So I would actually have her within about eight feet of the drums and the drums would be in the middle back of the room and she would be off halfway down the room. Uh, there's a cool thing that happens when you have drums and I've been doing this while in Jeff Powell, who you've talked to, we've discussed this before and Glenn Johns used to do it too. It called barn stalling, but you have a drum kit. If you put the bass amp and the guitar amp parallel with the front head of the kick drum yeah. facing the same way, you put a little piece of baffle between so them. So it's almost like a stage. The, yeah. Almost the, like a the stage drum heads that. facing out. So are the mm-hmm. bass amp and the guitar. Amp. If you do that and put a little bit of baffle between, you'll get basically no bleed in each other. It's pretty mm-hmm. amazing. Now I think it works best if you have the bass amp, on the uh, right side of the drummer by the hi hat, because the overhead, because your overhead's higher than like if you have something by the floor tom, mm-hmm. so you get less bass leakage. I usually don't put the guitar over there. I, at Sun, I'd have the guitar on the other side of the room. If you just angle the guitar amp instead of facing the drums, if you just angle it almost like you would like a figure eight mic or something, facing it away from the drum kit, but having the sides of the amp, you get basically no bleed in either because the microphone on the amp is rejecting from the side, the drums, and the amp's not projecting front to back at the drum. So you get basically no bleed on each other and the bleed you do get is pretty hip. And, then, and so you said you'd put up a baffle between the amp and the drum. The bass amp and the drum, yeah. Or bass just even like, a, I've used just like a guitar case. Just something that, where the microphone is that blocks the f- kick drum some. But there's just little things like that you can do in the room, just moving. If you have an amp, instead of trying to cover with moving blankets and stuff that really dull the sound, all you're doing is the mic is in there, so you're kind of choking off the mic, but you're also doling all the bleed you're getting in the rest of the mic. So I, I hate doing that stuff. But if you just move the amp in the room, you'll be shocked at how much goes away or what cool bleed you can get by just, moving Just turning it. the positioning of the amp They're Just bit. positioning the amp around. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a front room at Sun Little Office, which has this incredible reverb. It sounds like when the levee breaks kind of drum sound. So I would just leave the door open and put a microphone in there. And I would angle the, the amp either away from the drums, but facing that room where I get drums and guitar in that room bleeding because that would be my kind of like cool and you put up a room mic in there or something yeah like because it to me it has that when the levee breaks drum sound you can hear it on the song tennessee song on that record it's all that's basically the one mic in the front room catching all the drums but in, in her vocal mic is the drum sound on that first intro i love those old chess records and when they would do Howl and wolf or something i know it was a chamber and a plate and all that stuff but it had this really quick kind of guitar tone and that front room would do that really well depending nice. on where you had the amp. So it was things like that I was trying to capture. Any other interesting details about the mic choice for guitar amps and the rest of the drums? Or yeah, it's all pretty boring. Kind of the, the drums on that record are two mics. It's a, I used a, sure, a friend of mine, Mark Neal, who's a genius engineer. He told me once to use a Shure 55 on the kick drum, which is a, the Elvis mic, that Shure mm-hmm. mic. Everyone knows the Elvis mic. And I had one of those. And I was so tired of using D12s and all these things on the kick drum. So I put that on the kick drum one day, and it's the weirdest sound. It's the weirdest, coolest sound. So I started using that on kick drum in my own way. So the drum miking on that is that on the kick drum. And I have an old Altec M11, which is, it was one of Sam Phillips' favorite mics. It's like, they call it the Coke bottle mic, but it's it's yeah. the first American condenser microphone. It's tube. It goes all the way down to 10 hertz. And it's like a tiny little thing. It's Omni. Yeah. I put a pretty low on the, on the overhead and it catches the whole kit in a really cool way. And it's a glass capsule. So it has the weirdest sound Weird. to my ears. Yeah. I believe Steve Albini had a bunch of those up at uh, electric. Yeah. I think he loves those too. And they're, they're great for everything. Uh, I've used them on room mics, kick drum, far away, kick drum overheads. Horns. It's pretty embarrassing, but my first day there, he, he lays them on the floor and kind of tapes the capsule down so that it gets even lower uh-huh. to mic the drums. And I was walking around and, and I had my, my Doc Martin boots on and I didn't Uh-oh. notice it and I stepped on it. Oh no. Does he know you stepped on it? I think I told him. I didn't hurt it. I was lucky. I was lucky. Doc Martin's got a soft soul. Well, that's good. Because Steve, Steve Albini has a hard soul, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wouldn't have been too happy. Steve's a great guy, man. He's I amazing. Can't, can't wait. I haven't asked him to be on the show yet, but I have every intention of doing it. I hope so. I would, I would definitely listen to that one because yeah. he's a genius. So room size. What's the size of a room need to be to do some of the things you were talking about, you know, with the, the oh, gosh. band? No I don't know. I was that. told there'd be no math today. Uh, is it a big room? Is it like sun, the one we're in sun here? Sun is 18 by 30. Okay. Um, right. And 
So I, I engineer a lot in Nashville now, and I get to engineer out of RCA Studio A. So uh, I'm very spoiled about rooms. I yeah, did they have to be old. It has to be old. It has to be the room has to be built before 1980, or I get grossed out. <laughs> but I made a, re- a record recently in Canada in a barn. We made the whole record in a barn, and you just use your ears. I'm not an acoustician. I know people love prime numbers and all these things. I've never been. I, that's some, one thing I love to get good at, but I haven't. But I would just, it's the fun part is using your, that's part of what's fun is using your ears, put an amp and then walk around. When I, when I set my drum room, my drum room mics, if it's a room, I don't know, I, the drummer plays and I walk around the room and crawl on the ground until I hear the low end popping around or the snare sounding great. And then I'll put the mic there. Nice. So I think everyone knows this, but and I'm going to piss off a lot of people that fix my stuff here, but techs are the worst engineers and we are the worst techs right? because we use our ears and we don't care if it's broken, if it sounds good. I've got so many things back there that I have a Gibson amp right there that when I turned it on, smoke came out the back and it shocked the piss out of me, but it sounds awesome. So I don't touch it where a tech would recap it and retube it and everything. And then it might sound interesting, but it won't sound like it does now. Yeah, totally. And techs, every tech I know listens to Steely Dan when they come listen in a room or they're yeah. fixing something. <laughs> and I think those records sound like crap. And so I don't want Steely Dan to sound good through my stuff. I don't want to hear Steely Dan in, in the studio when I'm about to record. That's not, we're in the fun making business. We're not yeah, in the right. clinical business. You're not so, in the yacht business? No. I know techs that can't engineer. I don't mean to generalize them all, but most of them what sounds good to them isn't what goes to us. And what sounds good to them is what they're reading as the spec sheet on the paper. Or I've had them tell me, like, that DI won't sound good because it's got this transformer in there and that transformer, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, but have you actually plugged something into that and heard it yet? And, well, no, I haven't. I just know. Right. And that, to me, is so silly because you can use a... I've used someone's cell phone that recorded drums. Some guy was calling and let, his voicemail picked up the drums that we were using. And it sounded so cool through the iPhone limiter that we emailed it to him and we propped in the intro of a track somewhere. I forget, yeah, I love forget that who stuff. that was. But I just, it, to me, it doesn't matter. As long if it sounds cool, it's great. So. If it sounds cool, it is cool. Mm-hmm. Next question. Let's take the, the way back okay. time machine here. I'm ready. And let's go back to Sam Phillips doing How long a is session and take to go back? I don't know. You tell me. You're the expert. Are we back now or? Oh, yeah. Um, we're back now. Okay, Now cool. we're back. So it, you, let's go back to Sam doing a session in there, Elvis session, if you want. Uh-huh. What did that look like as far as the way it was mic'd up? Are you doing some similar stuff to, that you think that Sam was doing? Are you doing brand, well, Did he even have an SM7? No, there's no SM7s back then. Uh, this, the thing about Elvis at Sun that most people don't really, there's no drums on that stuff. The, that Most of the time, there's a few songs that had drums on there, but like That's Right Mama has no drums, which I think is another amazing thing when you listen to that record, how big it sounds, and it jumps out of the speakers, and there is no drums on there. Um, there's upright bass, there's electric guitar, there's Elvis singing and Elvis acoustic guitar vocals. Let's not forget those backgrounds of the ooh. Well, that, that's not on that original That's Right Mama. People oh, add okay. that later. Uh, right. That Altec M11, Sam used that on Elvis's vocal a lot. He would also use a RCA 77. Sometimes he'd use a Shure 55. He had a, a Electro Voice 666 microphone. That would probably be on the upright bass or Scotty. And then some of it's just room sound like that. If he's the M11 on Elvis's vocal, it's going to pick up Scotty. Scotty's amp's going to be the loudest thing in the room. So wait, the M11 is that Altec That's the Coke bottle, glass Coke bottle, Coke bottle was yeah. used for a vocal mic for Elvis? Yeah, he's at, if you think wow. about it, that was, like I said, the first American condenser microphone. That's 1947 when it came out. Uh, Sam had that. That was probably the nicest ex- microphone he had. Everything else was less expensive. The Shure 55, the Triple Six, those were dynamics. The RCA 77 was somewhat expensive, but mm-hmm. the the Altec condenser, that would have been the most expensive mic he had. No RCA 44? No 44. He, really? I've read later interviews where he said he had a 44, but there are no pictures of the 44 and Sun. And I've heard him talk about four where he said he never had a 44. I'm going to have to so reinvent my entire concept of what it used to look like. Yeah, there's. it's funny because I've gotten arguments with that about other people. Now, I have 44s. I love 44s. I don't think Sam had a 44 in Sun. I've, I've read one... Mix Magazine interview where he said he had a 44. That's the only time he said he had a 44 that I've seen. I think there may be like, I have a mono mag, like record listening magazine too where he said it, but he kept receipts. They all kept receipts. We've seen the receipts of the stuff he bought and I've never seen one for a 44. I've seen one for all the other microphones I know about. I've asked a lot of the old cats, did he have this microphone? Because it's pretty obvious what a 44 looks like. It's massive. It's square. It doesn't look like anything else. And none of them remember that one being it's in It's shiny. 
Yeah. But he did have two seventy sevens. He had two seventy seven. He had one, and then Cowboy Jack told me one day that he was bugging Sam to get some better microphones in the studio. And Sam called the bank and found out he had a million dollars in the bank. This would have been about fifty eight. And Jack was like, Well, go get us another seventy seven, damn it, like we need one. <laughs> so he finally like relented and went out. But when Sam built this studio, if you look around, like the he got he upgraded all the really really nice stuff. He had U there's U forty eights here. There's U forty sevens. There's about fifteen old sixties U eighty sevens. There's a U sixty seven. He went to all like the stuff he couldn't afford at Sun. So it's pretty interesting. Good segue. Why don't we start talking about where we are right now? Sure. Can you tell us about Sam Phillips recording services? Yeah. So Sam started run. Sun with no money. Nineteen fifty. He had worked two other jobs to try and make this little record studio happen. You got to remember that Sam Phillips was recording. I'm going to make this really long like Sam. I'm going to turn this question. Really Please long. do. Please but do. Sam, I, I think it's important. So many people think Sam was like a, a lucky hillbilly that just happened to record Elvis. But Sam came from Florence, Alabama. He loved radio. He loved communication. He started by recording big band music at the radio station. And he heard part of the reason he wanted to come to Memphis was the Mississippi River, and the other half was Beale Street, because on Beale Street at that time, it was the only place that black people could go and have fun and let loose and be themselves without worrying too much about the law or Jim Crow yeah. laws and all these things. They used to have talent shows. Down yeah, there, right? white people weren't allowed on Beale Street. It was, the, it was like what would be like Vegas or something now for them to just de- let loose. And at that time, it was Ike Turner, Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King, Roscoe Gordon, Rufus Thomas, all these great cats, Walter Horton, Memphis Jug Band, would all be down there playing. So Sam drove by as a kid and saw this, and it blew his mind. So he came back later, worked at WREC, had this cush job at the Peabody, top of the Peabody, recording big bands in the ballroom. And all he wanted to do was record the, all the town on Beale Street that no one was paying attention to. And, of course, these records wouldn't sell – because no one was buying those records back then. But he started this studio to do that. And uh, eventually he quit the nice job to focus just on Sun. Now, we all know it turned out really well for him. But in 1950, they didn't have recording equipment. You could buy radio equipment and multipurpose it for recording. You could buy a little home tape recorders, these things. So, so that's what he did. By 58, of course, they had started working on, you know, bigger studios had come along technology come on. Bill Putnam was designing all these amazing things. So Sam purpose built this studio. He spent $800,000 in 58, which is about $7 million today to build a unique high tech studio with an eye to it that it would be, it would grow with the technology. It wouldn't be like you built it in 58 and it would be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't keep up with the times. Yeah. It would keep up with the times and it still keeps up with the times. So he built this studio. It's got, at the time it had two studios. It still does. It had two lathe rooms. It had a mono and a stereo lathe room, three echo chambers, plate reverb. There's second floor of offices. The third floor had his penthouse suite. There was a dance floor and a bandstand on the third floor. There's a bar up there. It's all mid century. As you've seen, it's the most, it looks like Walt Disney puked in here. It's red, purple, That's green, awesome. yellow, but it's the most amazing studio. And the, the B studio is kind of designed after sun, but this room is much bigger. I think it's one of the greatest sounding rooms I've ever been in. This is where Wooly Bully was cut. The Yardbirds cut trade and kept a rolling in here. Mr. Bojangles was cut in here. John Prine did Pink Cadillac. Just tons of amazing Jerry Lee, Charlie Rich records. Wow. Um, is that amazing the piano? Stuff. piano? Same piano? Piano's been here forever. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's the best sound piano in town. And you, you can see there's these doors about what 12 feet 15 foot mm-hmm. tall doors that open and close around the room that dead and are live in the sound depending on how you want it and he did the same kind of ceiling shape as he did at sun raised control room he had all the top of the line equipment three track at the time yeah was the big thing and, right. and his echo chambers the hallway sounds good the lobby sounds good which i think he did on purpose everything had you know was second purpose of being used so wow i think it's it's just are there um, mic lines that run all through the building their chamber well the chamber lines run so the second floor is where two of the chambers are. So they pipe through the whole building. So when they designed the building, they designed it with chambers and with piping to get down here. I think it's like walking into his brain. I mean, he he dreamed every little bit of this. He worked three. It took three years to finish building this because he was so particular about everything, even like the light fixtures in the bathroom or the stone out front, the lime green. He was very particular about every inch of it. So I think that's what's amazing is you'll never know, you'll never see another studio built like this ever again because everyone will do it out of a pre-existing building or out of right. someone else's space. But this was built from the ground up. From his head. From his head, exactly. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, when I look at spaces, I instinctively start thinking about, uh, you know, what how, wh- how could things be arranged within this 
framework of yeah. this space or this house or yeah. this building. It's true. Even after I did my home studio afterwards, I, I realized I was like, huh, maybe I should have just thought about it from the ground up instead of, you know, yeah, you know, what ended up kind of being almost the same thing with the limitations. Of- well, I think that's the beautiful thing about Memphis too. And, and, um, like I said, I, I work at Studio A in Nashville. It's one of the most incredible experiences too. I mean, you go in there and it's that's Chet. It's like going into Chet's brain. But Memphis has this unique thing of three blocks that way, Sun Studio. Right here is Sam Phillips. About a mile and a half that way is Royal Studio, which is an old Royal Theater. That's where Willie Mitchell recorded all the Al Green records and Otis Clay and Ann Peebles. And they just did Uptown Funk there. And about two miles that way is Ardent which is where all the great big stars, easy top records were done. Zeppelin three was partly was done there. And these places, and Doug Easley had a studio, Easley and McCain, which is where all the great indie records were cut. And all these places and stacks, obviously, changed the world. They all remain completely unchanged, except stacks, which was rebuilt. But you go in there and they all are from the minds of the people who made them. They're built basically most of them the ground up and you come in and they just still are exactly what they are. It's, it's just incredible, I think. Yeah, so. it is really wild. Um, can you talk a little bit about the construction that makes this studio work? The ceiling, you know, we've got these angled uh-huh. stuff happening up there. Can you describe what's going on up there? Well, a it's bit? kind of a V-shaped baffling that goes around. Most people have a flat ceiling, they do clouds, but Sam was kind of unique and he wanted a live floor and then he wanted a V-shaped baffling up top. He wanted a live room, but not too live. So he worked really hard at working on the parallel surfaces and getting something, something to bounce to feel good and to feel natural, but not not too dead, but not so live that it would be uncontrollable. And I think he really accomplished that at Sun, but he mastered it here. As you can hear, our voices bounce around the room, but it's not, there's no unpleasing frequencies. He would walk around the room and clap, and if he heard a bad frequency, he would readjust everything wow. until he got it right. Well, so we do, do have a carpet under our feet now. So was it originally yeah, carpet? Originally too, it was tile, and then in the 70s, when everyone wanted to deaden everything, they decided to do a carpet in here, which it de- definitely cuts back on some of the uh, liveness of the room. It's still very much a live room, but it shortened the decay. Mm-hmm. And then they added, like I said, the drum booth and the vocal booth. But I've never been much of a big booth guy, but what changed that is I went and did it, because I never had a booth at Sun, but I did a record at Fame, and they have one of the most incredible drum booths. We put the and I asked, we asked Rick Hall how he did. He put the drummer in the booth, and he put a U87 really, really low on the drum. So we, of course, we did it, and it sounded incredible. And that changed my feeling about booths. Now most people do booths wrong. They try and get this airtight room that's with Orlex foam, and it's ugly and gross. And you go in there, and you don't you don't feel natural. You say something in there, and it, your voice dies right away, and all this stuff. These booths are just like the room you walk in. They feel amazing. They feel warm. There's cool '70s burlap, and the way the sound travels in there feels pleasant to the ear. Mm-hmm. You don't feel like you're in a piece of Tupperware. So when you put drums or a bass in there, or vocals or guitar, it sounds cool. So that kind of changed my opinion on booths. And, and Sam built these two booths as well. Uh, yeah, these were designed later in the '70s by. Him him and his two, his sons, Jerry and Knox, who own and operate the studio, they're both engineers and producers, and they were a big part of the booths. So. so quick question. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but did they just sort of conceive of what they thought would make a good booth, build it, and hooray, we lucked out? I don't do know. I don't know like much about the history up. of these booths. I think they had a general idea of what acoustically, obviously Sam and the, they, they know acoustics. And yeah. so I know they, they didn't just start building it from the scratch, but um, once you, you never know once you build it, how it's going to be until you, you know, start adding more burlap and less fiberglass, or if you put a glass here or wood there, what's going to do. So like the drum booth, the whole back of the booth is, is a wood wall, which I think is interesting. And then the rest is burlap. So it's a, it gives it an interesting thing. And they, and there's, a hillbilly aspect to it too they someone took a two by four and nailed the two by four on the floor so the kick drum won't go forward which i think is just genius you know because usually the kick drums you got to stop a take because the kick drums come forward you've got to find a sandbag somewhere but they nailed a damn two by four in the floor and I've it been works perfect problem jamming with my friend up yeah. at the studio but like i recently we were doing a session the other day and we just cockeyed the kick drum just angling so it's not going parallel with the room. It's going at an angle. And all this low end came up. So we started just doing the drums at an angle in there now. So I might have to move the 2 by 4 What's the but, exact angle? Um, 45 degrees nice. Fahrenheit. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm looking at my questions here. I just want to keep asking you about all this cool stuff. Um, I'll answer them. 
tell us a little bit more about transitioning Sun from what it was when you got there to bringing it to its analog roots. You, you showed up at Sun Studio. They had this stuff like a PC and uh-huh. Cubase and stuff like that. And then you, when you left, I think it was all strictly analog, right? Well, yeah, I put in, they had some great pieces there already. I just kind of, I thought what I was doing was kind of crazy. So I purchased a lot of it myself. Like I found the old RCA tube console that Sam would have used, the same model from 1936. So I bought that. It took a year to get fixed. I bought an old Presto lathe. I had an old Ampex 350 machine. They had they had one too, because Sam had two, one to record to, one to slap with. Um, they had some great old RCA mics. I bought like the old Altec microphone. We had a little Studer console. I didn't expect everyone to want to go live to mono. I, and people, frankly, aren't, a lot of them aren't good enough to do that kind of thing. And I know, like I said, it's your song. It's your style. I want to maximize whatever you are. So if if I have a metal band coming, I'm not going to make them sound like a rockabilly record right, from right, '56. Totally. So we had a, they bought Sun also got a cool old Studer console that I helped pick out, and we used Radar because I think Radar is amazing. And I brought in a one inch eight track of my own. So between those three things, we would either do it like straight. 1956 or we would cut to the studio and then mix down or there's a lot of options but for the most part it was all analog with and then adding the radar to it okay cool so tell us a little bit about some of the benefits and drawbacks to recording that way versus the pro tools world where you just kind of you know your mixer's in the computer and you've got as many tracks as you want and takes and all that well i think we're trying to get a live thing at Sun. We're trying to do minimal miking, minimal track, minimal things. So it's good to not have all those options. I think limitations are the best thing we have. When when you ever listen to the records you did, everyone always says like, man, I listen to those records I did when I was like 17. They sound so cool. It's because you only had a four track or you only had this or that. And just because you got 80 Les Pauls and 80 Neumann microphones, all these things, oftentimes that holds up this session. I One of the things I cannot stand is like, let's see how this sounds through this pre. Let's see how it sounds with this pre. Let's see how it sounds this pre well she's ready to sing out there they're bored out of their mind out there waiting for us to find the right pre and they may have lost the take or the vibe because we're sitting here trying to find some i'm a microphone geek i love gear but i don't want gear to ever get in the way of a session so i knew all that equipment we only had kind of hand-picked out pieces i knew every aspect of them i will i definitely try new things and you, you experiment on people but you kind of do it without them knowing you patch in something other than something you quickly go to the next thing but i never held the session unless like a tube went out and i had to pop a tube in or something on the tape machine you know can be iffy sometimes but i picked out pieces i knew work that i sounded really great and i knew what they did and that's the beautiful thing about Hey, I I mean, I got really scared as an engineer after I left Sun because I've been in one room for 10 years. I knew all the equipment inside and out. I knew exactly what they were good on, what they weren't good on. I knew what they could do, what they couldn't do. And I went in a room. I knew the room like better than my own, you know, bedroom at my house. But I went from that to rooms I'd never worked in before in Nashville with uh, people I'd never worked before, with equipment I'd never worked before. I never had a Neumann U47 in my life. So I'm going to a studio and using it. I'm not quite sure. What, I mean, obviously, it's a great sound of mic, but it doesn't sound great on everything. So it's made me a better engineer and definitely helped my skills. But for people who have their own spot, I'd say get the few things that you know and love. Get rid of the stuff you're not using. Get stuff that you love. And once you know those things completely in and out, it's pretty incredible what you can do and how fast you can be. Yeah, and the beauty of knowing that stuff and being fast means you can get a lot more sessions in there and you can record a lot more musicians and then maybe you'll find Elvis one day. Exactly. But just, you know, people, they like to spend time on their guitar tones and stuff, but then they're ready to record. So if they're spending time getting their guitar tones and then you're taking 45 minutes to hear eight different mics on the amp that are all minuscule things. And the thing that cracks me up about that is people only listen to the one thing. When I when I got sounds at Sun, we couldn't start till 6 o'clock at night. And so, I mean, I could start setting up at six. So the band and I get there at the same time as they're setting up, I'm setting up. It wasn't any of this. I Now I get to like set up the night before and the band comes in. This, it still kind of freaks me out because I can set up the stuff the night before, but I don't know how it's going to sound. I hear people playing together. Yeah. And so you can try eight mics on the guitar amp, but how's it sound with the other guitar player's amp? Or how's it sound with the vocalist? Or how's it sound with the drummer going? So at Sun, I would everyone would set up and I'd go, you guys all play. Give me like, play, jam a fun song. Don't do the first song we're going to do. Jam a fun song that gets you warmed up. And I'll have the sound in either that song or the next song. And by, they would jam maybe two songs and I'd have everything up 
where I'd feel really good about unless somebody had some really awful. Yeah, I try and do that a lot where I say, you know, pick a different song to warm up on. Yeah, but you had to hear it all together. That's, yeah. you know, and so that's, that's, I don't know what the question was anymore. I'm, I just, don't I'm just ranting now. I don't about remember. I just wanted to get you ranting. Me. That's all. Well, so hey, we'll take a break here for a second. We'll come right back in with the jam session. But before we do, Rockstars, I want to remind you that you can find links to all the stuff we're talking about, more about Matt Rossbang and his work and Sam Phillips Recording Services directly at our show notes at rsrockstars.com or recordingstudiorockstars.com. And then just search Matt and you'll find it immediately. Or if you're on your iPhone, you can just pull up the podcast app. You'll see the logo there. Click through. There's the show notes. It'll take you right to where you want to go. We'll be right back with the jam session. Nice. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, Rockstars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, Rockstars, it's Lid Shaw, and we're back now for the jam session. My guest today on the show is Matt Rossbang, and we're very psyched to be coming to you from right here inside this time capsule that is Sam Phillips Recording Services in Memphis, Tennessee. Matt, welcome back. Are you ready to jam? I'm friend? ready to jam. I was right, ready dude. to rock. Let's I'm kick ready to it. Jam Let's kick it. When you got started out in recording, what was one of the things that was holding you back? I think being so young, I couldn't stay out that late. My, I had to keep, keep coming home. I couldn't, my parents only out past like 1230. So I never, I remember when I first started entering, I never got to see like what happened at the end of mixing. Cause we would start, we'd start mixing and I never, I'd have to leave to be, cause I had school the next day until the weekends or something like I could stay a little later, but, but probably that I'd say. So is that, it was basically just that not having the knowledge yet, not knowing what goes on I in just the couldn't studio. Stay, I couldn't stay late enough. So I never got to see like. What happens, you know? So what was your solution for that? Get older. <laughs> Get Grow older. Up. Quit my parents. Quit my parents. <laughs> I had to quit that. Thing. I quit. Okay, so let's see. How about some of the best advice you received? Maybe that was from your parents. Who knows? Now, what was some of the best advice you received coming up in, in recording? Oh, gosh. I, I think, I don't know if I ever, I mean, I've gotten tons of advice, and of course I can't think of it right now because I'm being put on the spot, but I think... My best advice for people is to watch everything. I see so many people that come into studios that want to learn, but then they stay on their phone because they think it's like a boring part or something like they're not seeing you actually touch a compressor or something. And seeing how people talk to each other, seeing how people relate to each other, seeing how people, the engineer I learned from at Sun was so great about welcoming everyone, making them feel at home. Because at Sun, like coming here, people come and they freak out because there's Elvis Presley and he cut here and Johnny Cash and how I'm supposed to sing my song in here and they are so nervous and people are nervous in just a regular studio, let alone a famous one. So you have to really get good at becoming their friend really quick, becoming their ally, letting them know that you're here for them. Before I ever touched a piece of gear, I watched him for months just talking to people and how he how he handled people. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge part of it because this is a people business. This isn't 
um, who's got the best compressor in town. You might have all the great gear in the world, but if you're a jerk, no one's going to record with you, you know. But if you have, if you don't have a lot of equipment and you are a great person, people are going to work with you all the time. The other thing I'd say is be fearless. I, I, I like nothing sacred. I, I know it sounds crazy, but I've been in so many situations where you're in mix mode and someone's like, man, if I, I just really, I just really wish I could do that one thing over or put that one thing on the song or whatever. And everyone's always like, no, I'm sorry. We're in mix mode. Like, and I've worked with pr- producers like Dave Cobb uh, and Jim Dickinson and, and T-Bone Burnett and those guys, they, in Dave Cobb especially, nothing is sacred. On the Jason Isbell record, we cut Steel Trap Town full band at the studio Sound Emporium and we overdubbed on it and everything. We get to the studio, me and Dave are mixing the whole record. We got like one day left or maybe it was the last day, I can't remember. And we went out to dinner and at dinner, Dave and Jason started about like, Steel Trap Town doesn't feel right yet. So we went back there and 11 o'clock at night, Jason set up in the studio and played acoustic vocal. We, we did like one microphone. And he nailed it in the first take. And then we overdubbed on that. That became the version on the record. Wow. Even though we had the full band, the, done the, in the big studio, it's been all this days on, blah, 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 yeah. in a minute. And I can't tell you about other people. And I'm probably thinking about myself too that have been like, what do you mean? We got it tracked. We did it. We overdubbed because there, there's this mental process of we yeah. put tambourine on it. We did that, you know. And yeah, we place a lot of value on we place stuff a lot, that we already have. Yeah, well, that's it. But then if it doesn't feel right, it's not right yet. So we did it again. And that the, those things keep re- reaffirming in my mind they're, they're the right way to go. So we redid it. And that, that's some of everyone's favorite song is that one, you know. And we did it in five minutes, acoustic. I barely had time to set the mic up. I had to unpatch everything that was in mix mode and quickly before they got disinterested, patching just a quick microphone, put it up and hope, hopefully no headphones because we're, we're all patched this way and blah, blah, blah and go. And it worked. So That's great. I, I think those are my two big things, I would say. Okay, good advice, man. Great stuff. All right, now, how about sharing with us a recording tip hack or secret sauce, something that our listeners could use right now on a record? I Like I said, I think the quieter you play, the bigger it can sound. I think that goes for every instrument out there. The quieter you play, the bigger it sounds. I've heard T-Bone Burnett say something about that too, about mm-hmm. you know playing the instrument quietly and then turning the preamp way up, turning the gain up higher. I don't know too much about turning the preamp up. I, I usually record my levels pretty safe unless there's something I'm trying to hit because I don't like hitting – I'm one of the few guys that I don't like to hit tape hard. I think tape sounds – Depending on the machine and what's aligned at, I don't like to hit tape too hard. Um, and I don't do much EQing and compression depends on what it is and stuff. But I think the quieter you play, and I don't mean like super dead quiet, but if you hit drums at a medium volume, even on a big rock song, it'll sound huge. And your, your snare drum will sound much bigger than that nasty, just a tacky snare. Same with the guitar, same with acoustic, same with piano. Uh, snare sounds huge on the Margot Price record. Thank you, thank you. That's vocal mic. Vocal mic's picking up, but also mm-hmm. he's not playing that loud because he's got to hear the vocalist singing 15 feet away. So. Well, the snare sounds deeper when you play it quiet, too, mm-hmm. right? It does. Which and um, I, I'm a big, I'm from Memphis, so we like to put our wallets on the snare. We like that big kind of thumpy I think snare drum, if you're from Memphis, there's a higher echelon of snare. You have to get a certain level of snare drum because stacks, high records, sun, all these records, the snare drum is like louder than the vocal. So for us, it's like a very, it's ingrained in us that like the snare drum better be badass. Or, so no, wait a minute. Was that comment you just made, was that about how fat your wallet is? No, being a Memphis no. Guy? I actually... <laughs> All right, so how about sharing with us a favorite hardware tool for the studio, something that when you have it on on a session, it's with you, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm glad I got this with me. Uh, microphones, I think, are the biggest piece of the puzzle. Everyone loved Neves back in the day because it was one of the first pre's that had clean gain, a lot, tons of clean gain. Now every pre's got tons of clean gain for the most part. So I think certainly mic preamps do have sounds. APIs have sounds, Neves have sounds. But more importantly, it's what microphone you have. And instead of EQing, you can move a mic an inch and it changes everything, right? So especially with ribbon mics and condensers. So I think microphones are the biggest tool. So I like to have make sure I, I need to, the thing I care about most is the microphone list. But one of my favorite pieces pieces of gear is a Spectrasonic 610 complimenter. And and a lot of people who know me know I'm a just a complete geek for Spectrasonics. I have one of their consoles. I've got oh, tons nice. of their equipment. 
Um, I just think that stuff is genius. It, historically, it was on most of the great Memphis records. So, of course, I'm a Memphis boy. I got to love it. But a 610, it's still the world's fastest compressor. Most people don't understand how it works because they try and use it like 1176. It's so fast, it doesn't pump. It's the, the, the limiter comes in at 50 nanoseconds. The compressor comes in at 60 nanoseconds. It's so fast. Someone showed this to me once. You can pop a microphone into the complimenter. It's got enough gain to be a mic pre. Plug that into a speaker. You can drop the microphone instead of blowing out your speaker like you think it would. It's so fast it tracks the waveform and it, it will catch the transient. <laughs> it's that fast. So it's, I think it's hard for people to understand until I you show them that demo. But Don't try this at don't kids. Don't try it at home because you might blow it. But that's, I love that piece of equipment. I just love it. I love that piece of equipment too. Mm -hmm. I've only used them occasionally. I got a, yeah. got a buddy, Brian Carter's got one over. They distort really Donaldson. good too. Everyone knows yeah. them as a distortion box, but yeah. they're great for clean. They're some of the most transparent compression you can get. And, and the console that you have, is it? does it do some cool stuff too? It's, like it's an old 69 uh, Spectrasonics. It was made in Memphis, um, and it's a completely discreet 20 channel. And it's uh, just – Spectrasonics didn't really change their design too much. It's an early 101 design, so it's all discreet. It's uh, got plus 18 headroom. The EQ is three-band. Um, what I love about Spectra EQ is there's no zero. You can flip on the bands individually, but they start at plus two or minus two because why would you flip on the EQ if you weren't going to EQ? Q. So I love like little things like that because the guy was very much like a mil he was from the military, William Dilly, and he thought very much in that way. So cool, it's just man. a funky, cool console. Cool. All right. So now, how about a favorite uh, resource for the business side of doing this? You know, you've been working in studios, making records for a while. You're making a living doing it. What advice do you have for people um, as far as useful tools or, or strategies? to be able to do this for a living. Phone a friend. I think that's the biggest thing in the world. You can read a book, but every ex every thing you're going to have a question about is pretty much unique unto your situation, especially now with streaming, with bands, how they hit with Kickstarter, all these things now, it's so much different than before. And oftentimes what we're, I see now is we're recording with friends. Margot Price is a friend. A lot of the people I work with are friends, and they and friends first, I mean. And so you don't want to hit friends with some crazy contract or some, you know, my lawyer's going to hit you with this thing or blah, blah, blah. So the business side's changed a lot. And so I try and stay as far away from that stuff as I can. I hate talking about money. I hate talking about business stuff because I just want to make, I, I do this to make records. So you walk in and, and you look at the artist and you go, you want to, you want to make a successful record? You know, I'm the right guy, and you throw it on your fat wallet, your fat, fat Memphis wallet, wallet on, the on the snare, just to show him your bankroll. It's a, it's a, it's a money clip. So I, I wrap it up like a drug dealer, like in rubber bands, you know, big fat roll. Because a wallet hides that, you know. So right. You gotta, I want them to you see, the, see it. And it's hundreds. It's not It's not $1 bills. There's there's honeys in there. Turns out it's but, all uh, Monopoly money, but, you know, hopefully they'll <laughs> see that right away. But, no, I, I think I call, like, Jeff Powell, Mark Rubel, Vance Powell, Andrew Sheps, Neil Kaplan, and Dave Cobb. I'm, great, I'm blessed to know some great people in this in this place. And they all have unique perspectives on it. One of my favorites uh, is a guy in Nashville, Eddie Spear. He used to be Vance Powell's longtime assistant. And I had a question that was bugging me about how to handle a situation. And I called all those great guys. They all had great things to say. And I called him, and he had the best thing. And it just was the what I needed to hear. And he had the least amount of experience compared to these guys, you know. So I always call people because people are, give the best advice. And your situation is unique to you. No book's going to tell you. you know, half the people on the Internet that are spending all this time on the Internet aren't recording, right? So not, I, not nothing against those people. I love going on the message boards and reading stuff from time to time. But I don't have time in a day to to sit there and post a bunch of stuff on the forum because right? I'm in the session or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I yeah, don't... You barely had time to respond to my emails. No, I'm dude. sorry. What's yeah. the deal? I'm the, well, before I rely on something on the internet, I would rely firsthand with someone you trust and know. I always call those people first. Yeah. And then go with your gut. Your gut's going to get you a lot farther than... I would go I would go with your gut and your friends over anything else. Nice. Good advice, man. All right. So now uh, here's a hypothetical question. Imagine you had to start all over again doing this stuff. I'm actually looking forward to your answer because of the the kind of gear you have Gosh. used in the past. You needed to go to a new place. You needed some sort of simple setup to start with recording with. So you had to get some something to record, uh -huh. basic. Um, you need to find people to record. And then, uh, again, you sort of had to make ends meet so you could survive and keep recording and, and do it as much as possible. What advice would you have to somebody who's finding themselves in that situation now? I'm sorry. 
Good luck. But I would say if you're if you're in that situation, if you're still if you're still wanting to do it, and with all that, then I think you've got what it takes because this business is really tough, and you got to do it because you love it. So if you're obviously starting that situation, you're doing because you love it, and not because you know you got twenty grand to blow on on some money or something. But um, like I like we've said this whole time, this whole thing is a people thing. You and I met through a mutual friend. Right. I'm doing this because we have a mutual friend. Everything I've gotten in this business pretty much has been through friends yeah. or through word of mouth. So to get sessions in is word of mouth. So you need to go out. You need to meet people at shows. You need to do all these things. You need to introduce yourself. You can't do that over the internet, over the YouTube video. You can have a website with all your gear list and all that junk, but people aren't going to come there unless you're really fun to hang out with or really cool or people are interested by you. So mm -hmm. you're your biggest selling tool. As far as equipment, as I've said this whole time, I, I do have some great old vintage equipment and stuff, but there's nothing wrong with a Sure 57. There's nothing wrong with the SM7. You can get a lot of records done with simple microphones like those. And I, st I still use those. I use a SM7. Uh, we were doing a major label record the other day and the SM7 beat out a Telefunken 250, a vintage one. And we threw it up there. We, we had a 250, we had a U47. I was like, let's throw up the SM7. And the SM7 kicked both their butts really? just on wow. that day with her yeah. voice. Don't spend too much time on gear. Just get a good setup that works and doesn't crap out on you. That's solid. That won't ruin a take. And get your name out there and, and meet people and do stuff for cheap. Would you recommend people look into the analog world? You know, maybe get, get tape and start recording with that? Uh, most people today, I don't think... I think Andrew Shep said this best. He said, all the people that are nostalgic about tape are people who've never worked on tape or, can't, or aren't good enough to work on tape. And I think there's something to be said about that. I track 95% of everything I do goes to tape first, or I'm, and then I usually mix down to tape too. But I'm selected about who I work with, and I know who I'm going to work with, and I know if, the, if tape's not right for the session, I won't use it. Now, the one thing I would say tape-wise everyone should have, I think, is a tape echo. Full Tone makes a Echoplex recreation. There's a T-Rex makes a replicator now. I have two Full Tone tube tape echoes. I have four or five two-track or mono tape machines, all that do different slaps and stuff. But I pretty much use tape slap on everything from drums to vocals, to guitars, acoustics, percussion. I tape delay my plate reverbs and my chambers as pre-delay. I send stuff. Cool trick I learned from Dave Cobb is to send, like if you're slapping a vocal, sometimes we'll slap the vocal, then duplicate it and slide one of them to the lineup to the original vocal and use the vocal as it was sent to tape so it gets some, so the tape knocks out some of the weird you know, frequencies and stuff. So there's so many things you can do with it. And Tape Echo, I think, is one of the few things like Play Reverb or Real Rooms that you can't... Digital is getting close, but it just... There's something about it that sits in the mix. Mm -hmm. it, it just... It's... it's the Imperfections, too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's perfect. So, I mean, if you get one of those, it, not only can it be your distortion, it can be your echo, it can be your pre-delay, it can be your, like, weird warming stuff up. It can do so much. And so I would start there before I go buy a tape machine. Because if you're going to buy a tape machine, you're going to get one that's going to need a lot of work, and you're going right. to be able to fix it, and you're not going to understand it. And tape, then you have to buy tape too. Tape and yeah, and tape isn't made quite like it used to be. It's close, but it's not like 456 and some of the old, certainly like the old Scotch and stuff. You know, when I was talking to Jody Stevens about tape, we didn't get it on the on the interview, but right beforehand, he was talking about how tape originally was made using whale oil. Really? I didn't yeah, that knew there was. That. I think that was part of the substrate or something. Huh? Which is fascinating. Wow. Yeah, loved I know that. That's I just watched Moby Dick, too, the, the, <laughs> the new movie. Um, all right. Well, groovy, man. So now here's the, here's the big doozy of a question before we wrap up here. What, what is the single most important thing that our listeners can do to become a rock star of the recording studio themselves? Man, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, really. I, I guess it's um, what's great about our job is every day is different. Every day is unique to itself. You're never going to have the same day twice in a row. What you did... One day might work amazing, and it may never work again. I've had so many times where I did something by accident, and it sounds so incredible, and I try to recreate it, miking wise or gear wise or whatever, and it'll never work again. It's just one of those moments in times. You always got to better. You're trying better yourself. I loved my time at Sun Studio, but like I said, I knew that room incredibly well. I knew all the equipment incredibly well, but I feel like I got stuck. 
a little bit. Like I was doing the same things. I could only people were coming for that certain certain sounds and stuff, and I felt like I wasn't growing anymore. And so part of what I was excited about was I quit a steady job of ten years with a steady paycheck, and I knew it was going to be booked. I mean, no one's ever not going to want to stop recording at Sun Studio, and I went and became independent. So I based myself out of Sam Phillips Recording Service, but they don't pay me anything. I bring sessions in here, I and they call me if they have a cool session or something. But I go to Nashville, and I work all these different spots, and I kind of threw myself into the fire again, like I did when I first started at Sun, when I quit school and all this stuff to just be at Sun. Uh, and I threw myself into a bigger fire now, trying to make it an independent world. And it, I've grown so much again, and even at this stage, I, 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 for a while, I thought I'd be at Sun the rest of my life, you know, but I'm just, I'm just saying in a, in a moment's time, I decided to quit. I didn't think about it very long. It took maybe a couple, I had one opportunity to do the Jason Isbell record. I got asked to do that and I couldn't do that and be at Sun. So I, it took me about, I think six hours and I decided there's, I'm going to for, regret this the rest of my life if I don't do this Jason Isbell record. Yeah. I may never work again after this Jason Isbell record, but I won't regret that I didn't try my heart is to make this work. Wow. I didn't know the transition was so intense like yeah. that. It's, it so, sounds like your answer is be fearless. It is. Well, I, I, I've i never thought of myself as fearless, but I guess so. But I, I just, I did that record. It changed my life. Obviously, I'm busier now more than ever. I get to do all these cool things. I get to be at San Phillips. I get to be at RCA Studio. I get to all these things. And it could end tomorrow. I'm fully aware that this could all end tomorrow, but I'm just glad I tried and I didn't hold anything back. Every time you read a story about someone doing something amazing, it's never like he decided to stay at home and watch Netflix and play it safe. And then this happened. And I think a lot about Sam Phillips. Sam had this great paying gig at WREC at the Peabody in Memphis, Tennessee, recording big band music, announcing on the radio station, prestigious, prestigious job. And he left that to go record all these poor black people that no one would give the time of day to. And all his friends, Sam Phillips' friends, basically disowned him because they didn't understand why he would do this. Wow. And he left that to do this, and it was hard. He had electroshock therapy from nervous breakdowns because of it, but it all turned into this great, wonderful thing, and he helped integrate the airwaves. That's why he loved Elvis. He thought, if I could find a kid that could sing this great music that no one will buy be simply because they're black, if they'll buy it now, it'll help get them to this music. And that's what it did. When people listen to Elvis, that helped him listen to Little Richard and Chuck Berry and go find Howlin' Wolf and all these guys, yeah. right? So it integrated the airways. But Sam could have just not done that. He had two kids, a deaf mute aunt and a wife he was taking care of, and he could have stayed at the radio station and had the steady paycheck. And the, it was somewhat of a dream job. I mean, Sun Studio was a dream job. I could, I got to record every day in a famous studio. People were coming in excited to be there. It was a great job. But I felt like there's more, there's greater stuff I could do, and I wanted to better myself, and I wanted to try and make my own name as opposed to just being the, the Sun Studio guy. Yeah, it's amazing. And, Sometimes you got to just pull up the whole garden. Yeah, Start over, and right? I, that's what I did, and it was shocking. I still wake up days like, why don't you go back? I mean, that, what are you doing? That was great. Like, Well, now you can go back to record. You can go back as the artist. I can go play. as the artist, yeah, which is nicer. But and then, I you just, can, then when they mic you up, you're like, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> you doing, what are you doing, son? But uh, no, I, I would say be fearless because, you, my, in my opinion, you don't want to look back on something and regret it because you only have one shot at this stuff. So if I look back the rest of my life going, I should have done that Jason Isborg, especially now after all the great things that have happened. But yeah. I've always loved him as an artist and I knew what incredible talent he was and Dave's an incredible talent and stuff. And it, to me, it was a no brainer, even though it might mean me going and working at Subway you know, yeah. in a year from now when nothing's working. I but. think it was, uh, it was, it was butthole surfers hairway to Steven or something where they opened the song with son. It's better to regret something you have done than regret something you haven't done. Now that's a quote. That would be, if I had heard that before, that would have been my quote at the beginning of the show. That's a great <laughs> well, quote. Well, that's a good one for us to end on. Thanks so much for being here on Recording Thank you. Studio Rocks. That was with us, Matt. I think you've just set the bar for us oh, a gosh. little higher, you know? <laughs> can you tell our listeners how they can find you, learn more about you, and, and uh, reach out to you if they, they want to? Uh, yeah, guys, uh, you just Google me, and I've got a website. It's it's kind of under construction now because I keep changing. I'm very picky. You know, there's all these Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff, and just I've got the weirdest last name in the, in the game probably, so just Google that. <laughs> so M-A-T-T-R-O-S-S-S-P-A-N-G. Yeah, the hyphen the silent. Hyphen the hyphen so. side. <laughs> awesome. The most powerful hyphen of all. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Matt. Again, an honor to be here with you. What an amazing place for us to be bringing this interview from. And 
Look forward to seeing more of you around the studio. Hey, thanks for having me. I love being here. So. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.